Welcome to a weekly review of North Dakota's legislative news. Now, here's your host, Dave Thompson, with North Dakota Legislative Review. And welcome to North Dakota Legislative Review. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. There's an issue going about, and there are several bills dealing with this, and that determined about initiated uh, statutes and measures. There are several proposals to try to tighten things up. And under some of the proposals, constitutional measures could have a much tougher road to the ballot. For example, there are at least two proposals where it would require 60% voter approval for a constitutional measure to be approved. One of the other things that is also being uh, looked at is maybe having the legislature take a look at something that the voters pass in the constitutional amendment. There are also a number of changes to the Board of Higher Education being talked about still on the table. Remember, the House turned down the idea of a two-board plan in the first part of the legislative session. Well, there is a bill now before the Senate which would expand the Board of Higher Education from eight to 11 members, but Governor Burgum wants to push again for a two-board plan. Anything that will come out will require voter approval. And coming up in a, just a few weeks will be the March budget forecast, and that will determine the spending levels and spending decisions coming up. And a lot of lawmakers that we have been talking to are a bit optimistic because oil prices are creeping back up. But now, as we said, as the calendar has turned to March, we can expect that new state revenue forecast very soon. This session's marked forecast is expected on the 11th and the 12th. And as political correspondent Chad Mira tells us, this could settle the debate over some key spending issues this session. There are just a couple months left for lawmakers to set the state budget for the next two years. But first, they need a good idea of how much money they have to spend. We don't want to overshoot it. Senate Majority Leader Rich Wardner and his colleagues are working off a revenue projection released a couple months back. It was with those numbers that the governor proposed a $14.3 billion budget. We had two uh, forecasting agencies. We split the middle and uh, we think that maybe even the, all, both of them are very conservative. But all eyes now are on March 11th and 12th. That's when lawmakers get an updated revenue forecast. Warner says it could decide if state employees get a 2% raise or 3 If the forecast is correct, that'll even verify that we're okay at 2 and 3 Or if the governor's plan for the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library is approved. If it would happen to be a forecast that would be lower than the one we had in January, no question. It would have a very negative effect on any library Funding. Senator Tim Mathern, a member of the Appropriations Committee, says any change in the numbers can have a big effect. He even says it could be a matter of life or death. It'll be a difference between a high suicide rate or a lower suicide rate. He and Warner both say behavioral health services could suffer with a poor forecast. Mental illness, uh, drug addiction, those kind of programs. And they have really come to crisis proportion. But they remain optimistic due to the conservative approach in the last one. We are now joined by State Representative Carla Rose Hansen from Fargo. She's a Democrat and also the assistant minority leader in the House. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Dave. As an assistant leader, what are your jobs, basically? Uh, well, it's primarily to help the, the Josh Boshea, our minority leader, uh, but I also do some work to help our caucus uh, communicate better about our priorities. My background is in corporate communications, so what our leadership team has done is really look at the strengths that everyone has brought to the table, and, and so my role is really to help people communicate a little better uh, along with our staff. At a, like a 20 to 40,000 foot level, where are you at with your priorities? Uh, so at the beginning of the session, the Dem NPL uh, legislative uh, leaders um, outlined our priorities for the legislative session. So we set out an agenda that really has four main themes. Uh, they include making sure that we create opportunities for everyone to uh, achieve their American dream. This really revolves around education as well as criminal, uh, giving people with a criminal past uh, a second chance. We also want to emphasize making sure that we have good public services when people need them. Uh, we also have a priority around uh, strengthening families and communities. A lot of that has to do with public safety or behavioral health services that we really need to shore up. And then our fourth priority is creating an economy that works for all. And so some of that revolves around tax policy, but it also has to do with really uh, 
expanding our workforce development since so many businesses have a workforce shortage. So where do you think you're at? Uh, well, um, our, the Dem NPL caucus in both the House and the Senate um, are small, uh, but we I do I do believe we've made some big progress on uh, with these priorities. I think we've had some big wins in advocating for the priorities uh, that North Dakotans have. Uh, so we've uh, had some good wins in terms of, for example, uh, giving people a second chance. Representative Schneider advanced a bill related to ban the box that really uh, helps people advance in the interview process with a public employer so that they can get further along in the interview process. And we know that when people uh, have employment, there's less chance of them reoffending. Senator Dotsonrod um, has advanced a study to look at the problem about our rural grocery stores in North Dakota. So that's a uh, an issue that impacts our economies as well as our communities and families. Um, Senator Hogan has been a huge champion for behavioral health, really um, putting forward a really great proposal that will help um, the families and youth uh, in terms of the shortage about addiction services and behavioral health services, uh, mental health services across the state. There's some good uh, proposals related to services in communities, uh, targeted case management services in the schools. Um, and then just overall too, we've been really advocating for um, improved funding for K through 12, uh, improved uh, raises for our public employees to make sure that our private, our, our public sector workforce uh, remains competitive with the, with the private sector. And then uh, also nursing homes and DD providers making sure that their uh, reimbursement rates are strong enough to keep them going uh, in a solid way in North Dakota. So you're not busy at all. <laughs> <laughs> we, we keep very busy. Oh, speaking of busy, you're on the judiciary, which happened to be one of the busiest committees this time. Yes. You had a number of bills, probably over, probably 100 or more. We had approximately 100 pieces of legislation in the House Judiciary. A couple of things that you talked about. Number one was uh, giving people a second chance that did, yes. you know, has gone far. But mm -hmm. one that was actually proposed by Shannon Rose Jones of Fargo didn't get very far, I just wanted to get your take on it, this idea of decriminalization of marijuana, yes. you know, for, for very small amounts. Yes, uh, th that bill, I, I don't recall the number, but uh, that bill did fail in the House uh, floor. It was a very close vote. What that bill would have done would be to, um, uh, as you said, reduce the penalty if a person uh, had a small amount of marijuana. So it's not making marijuana legal, it's not making it uh, recreational like um, some past measures, for example, but rather reducing it from a criminal penalty of a certain level to just a fine. And the idea behind that was really to make sure that um, a person caught with a small amount of marijuana, it doesn't uh, have a negative effect on their ability to get housing or employment or even professional, uh, professional licensing. Um, so unfortunately that uh, bill failed, but uh, you never know what can happen you know, over the second half of the session either. Well, I was going to ask you about that because are there vehicles out there where that, this idea might be able to be brought back up? Well, that'd be, certainly be a good question for Representative Rose Jones next week, uh, but, uh, but I, I sure hope so. I think it's a, a valid idea that we should explore. One thing that you pushed during the session was yeah. this red flag bill mm -hmm. where you could go to, for a civil uh, seizure, if you want to call it, of a person's weapons if family and friends can go to a court and say this person is a danger to either him or herself or maybe to somebody else. That did not fare very well but it was a first bite at the apple. That's right, that's right. It was, it was disappointing uh, what that bill would have done. It was uh, 1537, I believe was the number. It would have created something called a public safety protection order. So it's like you said, a civil process where either a family member or law enforcement could petition the court to have a weapon temporarily removed. Uh, really the intent of that bill was to save lives in uh, by preventing suicides, which is a, a, a significant problem in North Dakota, as well as averting a school shooting or another active shooter situation. And that was, that was the true intent of the bill. Um, it's been uh, passing in a lot of other states. It's been around since 1999 in Connecticut and 2004 in Indiana, where uh, Mike Pence was governor. Um, and it's passed more recently in um, states like uh, New York, and um, I think I believe Minnesota is considering it this week. So um, there's sure some momentum to make sure that we're doing something to prevent gun violence across the country um, in a way that uh, provides strong due process um, and is constitutional, um, as has been tested in the courts. 
uh, but we'll continue to um, partner with the education leaders and law enforcement leaders, suicide prevention advocates to see what other solutions we might be able to pursue over the next few years. Well, it's not necessarily before judiciary, but I wanted to get your take on this yeah. idea of moving the prison, the, the domino effect, move, closing New England, sure. moving the New England prisoners to Mandan, or I mean to Bismarck, to the yeah. MRCC, moving the MRCC to the Jamestown, and then building a new Jamestown State Hospital. That hasn't gotten a lot of traction right now. What do you think? Is there any chance of that happening? Um, I, th I think there is a, a real interest in studying that issue more, and, and that's really what we've seen happen is having some of those big ideas be turned into a a study so that we can um, take the time to really explore all the ramifications of that domino effect, like you said, and really explore what, what the different uses of the different buildings could be, what shortcomings are there currently. And so I think, I think we just need some more time in the legislature to look at that. So probably not this session, but maybe there will be a study, look at it for two mm -hmm. years, and then come up with a plan. Yeah, that's likely. Now, you did earlier mention behavioral health, and that mm -hmm. seemed to be one of the big issues coming into the session because there was a lot of talk about that. Yeah. You had the Schulte report, you had the other report that was just sure. recently done, basically saying there's a crying need for behavioral health services, especially in rural North Dakota, and especially in West River country. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your sense of progress on, on that front? Yes, uh, as you mentioned, the study report did um, come up with a long list of recommendations that North Dakota really should do to address the crisis around behavioral health. That's both with addiction treatment and mental health treatment. Um, I'm really optimistic in what I'm seeing come over from the Senate. Uh, there's some strong recommendations in terms of uh, getting more behavioral health services in our schools, uh, community-based services, uh, targeted case management. Um, there's a new concept called uh, mental health uh, uh, vouchers, so it's modeled really similarly to the uh, uh, substance abuse disorder vouchers that really enables easier access to services across our state. So I'm hopeful that in combination some of these uh, improvements with policy as well as budget uh, will improve access to services across our state and really remove some barriers. Um, I'd always like to see it go further, but I, I really do think there's some good strides here. But there is bipartisan support. You know, you've got Senator Lee from West Fargo, mm -hmm. you've got Senator Hogan from Fargo, yes. and some people in the House who are really pushing this. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm really hopeful that it continues to advance in the, once it arrives on the House side. And Senator Warner is a, bit, Warner is a very big is. champion of as well. He is a strong advocate. Uh, in terms of some of the things, you know, that does also uh, dovetail with judiciary because some of the things that judiciary has been trying to do with justice reinvention okay. is try to keep people out of prison as much as you can. And in behavioral health, it was anecdotal, and there was some there were some statistics to back it up that judges in the West were sentencing people to prison because that's where they could get the treatment. That's right. Uh, so approximately 70% of people who get tangled up in our criminal justice system have either an addiction, a mental health diagnosis, or both. And it's true, we heard a lot of anecdotal evidence about judges saying, you know, well, in order to get you services, we'll put you in jail, which is not the right uh, environment for a person who um, really their problem is is that they have a behavioral health issue. Um, the justice reinvestment uh, reforms that we passed two years ago, like you mentioned, really meant to intervene in into um, the situation when a person is coming out of incarceration, let's get them set up for success so that they don't reoffend and come back into the justice system. So we're providing them with some case management type services, but also getting them connected to the behavioral health services they might need. Um, in some of the new policies that we're seeing uh, this session, we're looking to expand that offering uh, going into the next biennium, which is a great thing because we've seen some early success from the reforms that we passed two years ago. Well, that's ago. what I was going to ask. Yeah. Are there some statistics that show some success then? Yes, they, it's very metric based and um, it, it is early because what one of the metrics that we look at look at is recidivism rates. You know, what, uh, what is the rate of someone reoffending? And you know, you want to look at that over a period of time, but the early indications, if I recall, are very positive. And uh, so we're, we're very hopeful and looking forward to seeing that expand. Well, one thing that you mentioned was about state employee raises, and that yeah. seems to also be bipartisan support for that because 
state employees had to go two and sometimes three years without a raise. That's right. And now there's a proposal two and two, the House has passed so far, mm -hmm. two and three in the Senate. You've got the revenue forecast coming in March 10th, 11th, mm -hmm. 12th, right in there. Um, are you optimistic that something else is going to happen? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we could get to a three and three uh, rate for our public employee raises. Uh, we really need to look at um, public employee raises in the context of the overall uh, labor market in North Dakota. You know, we have a workforce shortage and we hope that we attract the best and brightest to our public employee positions because they have important jobs to do, you know, providing public services to the citizens of North Dakota. and. Um, the public employee positions have to compete with the private marketplace and so I think a three and three raise really allows the public employers to compete with the private. I know this revenue forecast is probably held close to the chest right now yes. but are you hearing anything any anything anecdotally from from people are they optimistic are they are they looking forward to it do they think because oil prices are ticking up things might be better I do hear a lot of optimism about what the revenue forecast will be when we get it on March 11th and 12th. Um, I'm hopeful that the price per barrel ticks up several dollars so that we can make sure that we fund all the unmet needs across the state of North Dakota. And that leads into Prairie Dog. Okay. You were one of the yes votes on Prairie Dog. I was. And that passed overwhelmingly, but there was a long debate on it. It was. Now it's in the Senate. We don't know what's going to happen with it. Why did you support Prairie Dog? Um, I really see there's a a lot of need for infrastructure across the state of North Dakota. I mean, we have um, a sh uh, we have a heavy reliance on federal funds for, for example, our roads and our bridges. And so, I, I like the idea of making sure that all the communities <coughs> across North Dakota have some access to funds that they can put toward their infrastructure needs. Um, where I live, we have a. Um, a concern among a lot of people around the specials. And so if we could dedicate some of the money that we get in my community toward the major thoroughf thoroughfares, for example, that could put uh, less burden on the specials that we have to pay as just one example. But I do like the idea that it serves all the, commu all the communities in North Dakota. And of course, this is set up that it's kind of a bucket at the end of the line. Yep. If we get enough you know, oil revenue, that bucket will start filling and then mm -hmm. cities can start tapping into that. That's right. Um, any idea how what Fargo might be in line for? I've heard the number, but I don't remember it off yeah. the top of my head. I've, I've heard $50 million, something like that. Might be more Maybe than that. Maybe 30. Maybe 30? Yeah. Okay. I'd have to check. Yeah. That, there, there's all sorts of things that play on that. Yeah. So are you optimistic personally about the revenue forecast? Um, I am, and I'm, I guess I'm an optimistic person in general. So uh, I always uh, think that North Dakota is, you know, got bright things ahead of it, and, and I think the revenue is, is part of that. One thing I am concerned about, though, is um, in terms of revenue, is the proposal around eliminating the income tax. So that passed the House, it now heads t toward the Senate, and I think that's a, a misguided idea. Um, when we look at the revenue model that we deal with uh, for North Dakota, you know, people often talk about the multi-legged stool, three-legged stool, if you will, property tax, income tax, and uh, sales tax and eliminating income, income tax, I think would be a mistake. It would put more reliance on the other legs, put us out of balance, if you will. Um, and so I, I am concerned that a vote to eliminate income tax would be a vote to increase property tax. And I think that would be the wrong direction. Okay. I have to ask you about this board of higher education, yes. the gyrations that's gone through with the three board to two board to the expanded one board. Okay. When you had the two board bill, how did you vote on it? I voted yes on that one. And why? Um, so my district is adjacent to NDSU, and so I have a lot of um, people who work at NDSU who live in my district, and they were very favorable to the idea of having a board, uh, one board for the research institutions, one board for the, for the other educational institutions across the state of North Dakota. So I listened to my constituents, and I voted you know, the way that they wanted me to. Um, I do see merits. I see both sides of the issue, and I certainly see the merits. And so I, I followed the wishes of my constituents. Um, you know, as you know, it didn't pass. Uh, but uh, there's always the second half of the, the session to see if see what might happen next. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but Governor Burgum is still pushing for a two-board yes. solution and yeah. is asking the Senate, which has another resolution, mm -hmm. to amend the resolution to make it a two-board bill. That's right. Anything, any chance, because the, the House turned it down and it was a fairly strong no vote. Right. Is, do you think there's any chance that maybe 
it could come back and you might be able to get a few more votes? It, uh, you know, I think it's dangerous to predict what might happen in the last final <laughs> days of the session. <laughs> yeah, the OMB bill could be real interesting That's as right. it always is. That's the catch-all. Do you see any sticky wickets that uh, could, you know, at least delay the end of the session? Uh, you know, that's also hard to predict. Um, I, I think uh, there, the ethics measures, I think, are, you know, a new factor in our legislative session this year. So we have two uh, pieces of legislation that we're considering right now. As you know, uh, there's a Senate bill and there's a House bill. Uh, in my opinion, the, the Senate bill upholds the, uh, the spirit and the intent of measure one, the ethics measure that the voters of North Dakota passed last November. Um, the House bill doesn't uphold that spirit and intent quite as well, I think. So how those get resolved, I think, will be an interesting thing to watch as well. All right. I ask every legislator this, okay. and we just have a few seconds left, so let me ask you. If you had to put a bet on when you will adjourn, how, how many days in will you adjourn? Uh, mm, with five days remaining will be my guess. Okay, my so bet. 70. So yeah. you're talking 70. Five. Uh, 75. Sorry, 75, that's right. yeah. Well, you're a little less optimistic than Dwight Cook, who says maybe 65. Oh, wow. So we'll All see right. what happens. All right. Our guest, Carla Rose Hansen from Fargo. She's a Democrat and the assistant floor, full floor leader for the Democrats in the House. Thank you again. Yes, absolutely. Governor Doug Burgum testified this week in front of the Senate Education Committee. He's still fighting to create two boards to govern higher education, despite the fact that the House struck down the idea earlier this month. He's now hoping the Senate will bring it back to life. After the two-board proposal failed in the House, Senate leaders unveiled a proposal that would expand the one board already in place. But the governor said that doesn't go far enough. We caught up with him to find out why he's still pushing for something lawmakers have already rejected. It's an important topic for people to understand because the, the governance model for higher education in North Dakota is hardwired into our constitution and we can only change it with the vote of the people. So the discussion going now is uh, where, where will this go? Will it, will it lead to a resolution which could be on the ballot in November of 2020? Uh, that's the discussion we're having today, but excited and grateful that the Senate is keeping the conversation alive. Are you concerned that maybe what the lawmakers are thinking isn't in line with what the voters would, would want in this situation? Well, I think there's uh, always, in any political process, it's always easier to uh, make an incremental move uh, than it is to make a, uh, a leap forward. And I think the, but again, it's great we got consensus that people think that we need to, to make a move and move forward because that's not even existed sometimes in the past. But I'd say the only uh, disagreement is the degree of, of uh, the, the length of move, but knowing that we maybe, I hope it's not another 80 years before we get on the ballot to change it, but if we're gonna change it once every 80 years, we better make a change that's, that goes beyond incremental, that actually sets us up for the success for the next 50 years. And Chad Mira joins us. So Chad, following that, yeah. I'm going to ask you, what do you think the chances are of going back to a two board model? Well, I don't, I don't wanna make any predictions, <laughs> but <laughs> I will say this, he, he testified earlier this week in front of the Senate Education Committee and uh, the committee members were listening and you could tell they were taking his request seriously, asking a lot of good questions. So you never know, there is a resolution out there to expand the board that's already in place. Well, a lot of lawmakers do, are kind of getting on board that maybe we do need to make some changes, mm -hmm. we just don't know if they're willing to commit to creating a whole second board yet. Speaking of change, as we talked about it earlier, the new revenue forecasts are coming up on the 11th and 12th. Yep. One's going to be from the state forecaster. One's going to be from the legislative forecaster. Yeah. What are you hearing? Well, a, a lot of optimism. People are excited about it. Uh, and it's interesting we have two forecasts. We'll talk more about that in a second. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are excited about this upcoming forecast because the ones that came out in December and January were intentionally meant to be a little more conservative. You know, when they start off the session, they don't want to be passing all these bills uh, and then find out they don't have the money to spend on them. But, you know, we have two forecasts. We'll have to see if they differ at all. They're doing this because the oil revenue has been kind of difficult to predict in the past. Obviously, it's a very volatile market. So we have two forecasts now, and we'll see if they have different outcomes. And we'll have to get back to that next week because mm -hmm. we run out of time. Yep. Thank you for joining us for Legislative Review. I'm Dave Thompson.